guys listen to a podcast known as The Skeptic Zone, the podcast for reason and science from Australia. You will have heard about this many times over the last month. If not, this will be brand new to you. Okay, so let's see. Only we should be playing now, but it's playing here. I'll play that. The psychics offer wonder and endless possibilities in a world that often seems difficult and mundane. They promise health, wealth, wisdom, eternal life. But if you examine the record, it's not the psychics, but the hard-nosed scientists who have actually delivered the things that improve human life. Does anybody know who that was? Anybody? James Randi, uh, oh, okay. oh the father God. of modern skepticism, who passed away very recently. So you know, he made it a big deal to investigate psychics and mediums and all sorts of other paranormal things. So um, part of the end of what Randi said there was that psychics can't do any of this, science can. So the project, this project, was to basically put some data behind the statement that the psychics, you know, to see if the psychics can do what they claim they can do, put it that way. So this is um, a little list of what I'm going to be talking about today. First, what is the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project? We're going to be talking about the data collection that we did, and then, uh, very importantly, the scoring process. I'll be giving you the results, and then I'll get into some specific categories that were uh, predicted and what the results were. And also we'll talk about the misses. Uh, also, why people believe and a little bit about how we've publicized this project, and I'll give you some closing thoughts. So, the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project was created and managed by Richard Saunders. He is uh, the former president of Australian Skeptics and a life member now, and he is the producer and host of the podcast I mentioned, The Skeptics On. So this project had the goal of gathering and reviewing enough data to be able to draw valid conclusions about whether people really do possess these abilities, by psychic or any other means, uh, to reliably foresee future events. And I was a member of that team. So today I'm going to give you an inside perspective of this unique investigation. So the project ran for about 12 years. It was a long-term thing, and it was completed just last year. It consisted of almost 4,000 psychic or otherwise Paranormal predictions made by over 207 people in Australia claiming to have knowledge of future events. Right? Now, the majority of these people label themselves as psychic and they say they have psychic powers, but it also includes people who you know, say, oh, they can divine the future through astrology or numerology or throwing bones on the floor, or whatever. But we're, we're just calling them all psychics. Um, and the predictions, psychic predictions. So all predictions analyzed were published in Australian media. So these weren't something that someone went into a room and got. These were officially published things that you can go and track down. Magazines, newspapers, whatever other source. Uh, and it covered a 21 year period. Why 21 years? Well, they had to pick something. And they just decided they would do uh, you know, from 2000 on. And, and it stopped uh, at 2020. And as Richard Saunders would say, we didn't go in here to debunk. If we found out that psychics actually could tell the future, or particular psychics, or they're really good about predicting certain things like maybe mm, you know, natural disasters, we would publish that. Uh, and we believe this is the largest such effort ever taken. Uh, you know, there, there are people who have looked at like one year's worth from one magazine or things. Because by the way, this is how this is normally done. The, these people who are famous for doing this, they get paid to contribute to a magazine or a newspaper, and very often it's for the coming year. You know, it's the January issue or it's the late December issue. This is what's going to happen next year. Right, and, and we have seen other clubs go in for one year back and say, oh, we looked at a few newspapers, and here's a list of what they predicted and how they did, but never for such a long period of time with so much data, right? So the data collection was done. It started with Saunders all by himself, and then he had some help. He collected and archived all the predictions. So he wanted copies of everything, 
on his computer or otherwise print so that if anyone questioned something, he would have it to show them and he wouldn't say, well, I remember seeing this in a magazine somewhere, right? The Psychics Directory, that's an official thing, was the first source that was mine. Then other magazines and print sources we used. Uh, he went to the State Library of New South Wales, State Library of Victoria, and other places, I believe, and actually used microfilm in some cases. Then they copied predictions that were made on Australian radio. He recorded these, TV and YouTube, right? It was very labor intensive. It took thousands of hours over many years. So then the next problem happens. Okay, now you have this giant database of all these predictions. How do you score them, right? It's far easier to say that something is gonna happen. I can rattle off a thing, 10 things right now. And for you to go figure out whether they did happen, especially if it was 10 years ago, that takes a lot of work. So he realized it would be a large sustained effort. So starting in 2016, he's tried to get the Australian skeptics to meet, and some members did, they began the scoring, and then Saunders continued the effort over many years on his own, but it was going very slowly. So then the pandemic happened, and a lot of places were locked down, especially Australia, like totally. And he decided this would be a good idea to try to get a team together to do this over the internet. So in mid-2020, with the support of Susan Gerbeck, uh, she's a well-known uh, skeptic and skeptic organizer, an international team of volunteers was formed to complete the project. So that's when I got involved. Uh, I know Susan, and I, I heard this was happening, so I volunteered. So we met weekly on Zoom sessions, one by Saunders, for over a year, researching, analyzing, assigning a score to every single one of the predictions in the database. And the predictions were all done collectively. So it wasn't one person's opinion. So, you know, we would look, we would Google it, and figure out what we could find out, look at other sources, and then we'd sometimes argue about it. Is, is this correct? Is it not? Did this actually happen? That sort of thing. Uh, and as we worked on the predictions, the actual numbers grew, because often in a magazine, it would be one line or one sentence where a psychic said, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen. But they're all separate things. So the number of predictions in his database grew as we broke the one thing up in that case to five things. And then we'd have to go investigate each of them separately. Right? The time spent by our team scoring these predictions was on the order of 1,000 person hours. We did a quick calculation. So like 42 person days continuously if one person had done it sitting down without stop. So how did we score the predictions? So something was either correct it was wrong, it was obvious. But then there were these other categories. It was unknown. It was something that we couldn't really figure out if it happened, so we called it unknown. Then there's expected, right? A lot of times someone will say, not exactly, but the sun will come up tomorrow. So, sorry, we're not giving you correct on that. <laughs> Even though the sun did come up tomorrow. So we call that an expected event. They're not a really valid future prediction. And then there were ones that were very too vague. I'll give you examples of, of these things. So, I'm going to cut right to the chase here. The data showed that these people were unexpectedly good at predicting future events. And the vast majority were absolutely demonstrably correct. They avoided making any predictions about, uh, you know, that were expected, too vague, unfalsifiable, just totally wrong. Important events, they got all correctly. Virtually no big events were missed. And so the evidence demonstrates that they're really high. And if you believe that, i got a bridge in London. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to go into the details of the categories that we score things. First off, unknown. So some predictions were impractical or actually impossible to verify, right? Somebody would predict a spiritual moment for a celebrity, you know, or some emotional happening should be happy this month. Events are dated a long time in the future, all right? So it was well beyond our predictions. They say something's going to happen by 2030. We don't know yet. So right now it goes into the unknown category. There are complex trends, financial statistical things, which frankly, maybe if we hired a team of statisticians, we could have figured out, but we couldn't do it. So it went unknown. Um, there are 79 type of, uh, of this in the database. So here's some examples of the actress Sharon Stone. Financial investments will start to show good profits now. So in parentheses is the name of the, uh, Psychic, I guess her name is Anne Anne, some time ago. And, uh, and, and then the year she made the prediction for that, for that coming year, for 20s, 2002. 
So what do we do? We call Sharon Stone, we, we ask her who our financial advisor is and just put us in contact with them, there's no way. So that's, sorry, that's an unknown. There'll be good airfares before Easter, some of the best prices in 15 years from 2014. That's kind of a statistical thing, we didn't have the wherewithal to figure that out. Uh, about the, the uh, Australian Prime Minister, I do see him making his 90s, said in 2006. Well, he turns 90 in 2028. He's not dead yet, it might happen. That <laughs> might be a correct prediction at some point, but regarding our study, it's unknown. And Sandra Bullock will remarry until, the, won't remarry until the 50s. So she's still single, but she's still in her 50s. As of right now, it could happen, it could be true, we don't know. If she passes, if she gets into her 60s, then it would be wrong. But right now, it's just in our category, in our database, as unknown, right? Uh, William and Kate, there's a lot of predictions about the British royal family. <laughs> Australia's a commonwealth, we're obsessed with them, just like they are with uh, Hollywood celebrities. Uh, William and Kate, William to outlive Kate, marry again. Okay, don't know. They're both still alive. So then the other category of interest is, is expected. This is a common thing that psychics do, to make a large number of very obvious predictions. Not quite like the sun will come up tomorrow. That would be too obvious for them, but sort of in that vein. And then they often take credit for these events as being correct. See how good I am at predicting the future, right? They're either likely or absolutely going to happen. Uh, we did not give them the correct on this, as they said, even if they did happen. There were 580 of this type in the database. That was a huge, huge percent. So many children going missing over the next two years, just a general prediction. That happens every year. Uh, the winner of this uh, race will be a young, middle-aged, light brown or chestnut horse. When is it not a young, middle-aged, brown horse? Wild storms and brush fires. If it doesn't get the location, it's Australia, by the way, because these are all being made in Australia. And yeah, that happens every year. That's almost like saying the sun is going to come up. Uh, I see large earthquakes happening in several parts of the world. Conveniently, all the places earthquakes always happen in the world. <laughs> so, no, you're not getting that win on that. And a major bank experience a cyber hacking situation dramatically impact. Again, kind of vague, but still that happens all the time. Banks, you know, exhibit this. Snowstorms in Germany, again, that's almost like the summer. <laughs> but people get paid to do this by magazines and newspapers. All right, so the other common thing psychics do is to make ambiguous predictions, right? And then they also take credit for those being correct. We put those in a too vague category. It's almost 700 of that type in this database, right? Before the end of the year, we'll also see a lot of underhanded things revealed in politics and business. Upheavals <laughs> <laughs> and shocks in institutional political life. You can make this stuff up. But yeah. George Bush and his daddy, well, they put a lot out and it's coming back, so I see relations with them would be very difficult. <laughs> now, this could have been, some of these are gray, right? This could have been the unknown one, because how would we know that? Um, so some, some of them were a little bit gray, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. A uh, recent agreement with a man close to Elle McPherson will attract a breakthrough love wise, but was unsure whether the compatibility issue will wash. Again, vague. Also, how would we know that? Unexpected objects falling to Earth, we don't know what to do with that. <laughs> Nothing was reported, it could have just been wrong, but we gave it to, okay, we won't count on wrong, we'll be too vague, we don't know what unexpected objects falling to Earth mean. Uh, okay, here we go with the real weird ones. At the universe, we will respect money more, there will be a better, more efficient economy. People will use money wisely, as they will become more spiritual and use it to serve you badly. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yes, now we get into the planet Uranus, I'll say it that way, it's Aries, you know, political leaders. Uh, and then we have a celebrity couple involved with the movies, going to visit the coast, how many celebrities are there. A prominent figure will fall in Japan, we didn't know, is that somebody in business and politics, in the media, we didn't see anything in the news, we could have marked that false, possibly, but we just said too vague. And then there's this one, purple flowers being used to prevent brain bleed. <laughs> Beneficial to brain surgery. Well, didn't see anything, but we're not doctors. We didn't have access to medical journals, so we didn't mark it wrong. We just said too vague. So sometimes we gave them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, global charity could appeal to her Nicole Kismet's soft side. They can also, you know, we really couldn't check that. Uh, the Prime Minister of Australia, extremely challenging year, and half of the months of the year, <laughs> probably all the time. That might have been an expected one. 
Uh, show him the brand. I don't know who that is. Going into a spiritual year. I don't know what that means. Being creative. Okay, this is a great one. Who won the U.S. Pre 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 election? This was 2020. Bear in mind, one month before the November election between Hillary and Trump. The numerology shows that both Mr. Trump and Biden have a chance of winning the next few years. Whether there's election, it's still up to the people to decide. <laughs> or the insurrectionists. That would have been impressive if that was there. All right. This is a peek into how we actually kept the data in the database. Right? Richard originally put in the, all the first columns a year predicted by where published, yada, yada, yada. And then we had to fill in the verdict and we put notes so that we would know why we made the decision if it wasn't obvious. Oh yeah, and just going back there, we have in the fourth and fifth category, categories of topics and the main subjects, so you can just filter and sort to look at things in certain ways, which I will show you some later. Right, so I mentioned there are gray areas, right? So, as I said, we can count uh, predictions as correct or prove that correct, but we're obviously going to happen. Uh, they're in the expected category. Uh, and this absolutely and significantly reduced the percent correct. And, but we thought that was justifiable, not to give them, yes, you're correct, about the sun will come up tomorrow, right? Now, on the other hand, we scored some borderline expected predictions as correct. That was the one about the uh, horse race, uh, the horse with a proven record over 12 months is going to win. Probably likely, right? We did give them correct, because that, in fact, did happen. Um, then the last one there, Queensland swim star. Basically, it says she's going to try for a media career and it's not going to go well. Well, that probably happens a lot. One could say that's expected, but in fact, it did not go well when she tried, so we gave that as correct. <coughs> not an answer. Oh, okay. Okay, so this is another thing. Predictions with coin flip probabilities. There were a lot of them there, there about sports and things like that or an election between two people, right? They were treated equivalently to more unlikely predictions. And if, if they were correct, we said correct. If they were wrong, they were wrong. But it was really a 50-50 shot in most cases. So that drives the percent correct towards 50%, artificially inflating the success rate. Keep that in mind when you see the absolute number of the ones they got correct. Here are some examples, right? This team, I don't know who they are, will make it to the finals. Well, the odds were 50-50. Essentially, at the time when this prediction was made. Uh, this grand final, I don't know what kind of race that is, but a uh, prediction was made on the day of the game and the odds were 50 50. Uh, Australian cricket team will do well on tour this year. Well, you do well, you don't do well. Kind of a 50 50 shot. And then this Ashes cricket, uh, Australia to win, odds were 50 50 at the time of prediction. Now, in some cases, we scored predictions correct that can be judged as too vague, but nevertheless were fundamentally correct. I mentioned that before. Here's some examples. Major American cities targeted for terrorist attacks. A lot of carnage is indicated. This was made before the September 11th attacks. So I gave them correct. Well, major cities, well, it was really just one city. Um, and, you know, but they got that one generally correct. So here are the actual results. 11% of the predictions were correct by our scoring method. This included a substantial number of coin flip predictions, as I mentioned, but most predictions, almost 90, were unknown, expected, too vague, or just flat out wrong. The majority of the whole database, even with these uh, conservative scoring methods, were flat out wrong. And this is a graphic. So, bottom line is the people who are appalling with bad at predicting future events, people who get paid to do this and are famous for doing it and are believed to do it enough that the magazines and media seek, seek them out. Mm -hmm. And as Richard Saunders put it in conclusion, most of what was predicted did not happen and most of what happened was not predicted. <laughs> so, since the majority of them were wrong, let's look at that, right? 53% of the database, over 2,000 were just flat out wrong. And here's some examples. Charles and Camilla, oh, the king and queen now, they won, right? 
So they were married in 2000 and 2001. Uh, this was predicted in 2000. Uh, no, nope, happened later, 2005, quite a bit later. So that was just wrong. Counterfeit note swapping Australia. We found no record of that ever happening. Does anybody remember being able to buy antique gravity lift devices on Amazon? <laughs> Back in 2001? No, I'm still waiting for that. Uh, and uh, this one saying Osama bin Laden uh, will not be caught. Don't think we'll ever catch him uh, from 2005. Yep, no. Wrong. Uh, Brad Pitt, Angela Jolie, their relationship will last another year. That has to be really bad when you're one of those people who read this prediction a few blue seconds. But they went on quite a bit from 2007. To, it's a lot longer than that. Some marriages last at all. It's 2019 before they actually divorced. And Barack Obama will fall from grace. Something about pork futures. <laughs> People, I would say you can't make this shit up, but they do. <laughs> uh, and now, since the September 11th attack, pretty much all the time afterwards, every year, it was predicted there's going to be another terrorist attack. Mm -hmm. uh, also, Sydney, this is a big one. It was a you know, big city in Australia. They're always talking about the bad things are going to happen to Sydney. Here was one about a large earthquake. Mm, no, it still hasn't happened. And, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Stevie Wonder, that's going to be great picking up the paper and reading that you're going to die this year. <laughs> no, not yet. And uh, yeah, there we go. This was from the 20, 2020 election, right? That uh, Joe Biden's going to drop out before the election. So now I'm going to show you a little bit of details of some particular subject of interest, especially to people in Australia and these people who predict for them. So the Queen of England, uh, it was the second, right? 26 predictions in the database. I'm actually surprised it was only that amount. But there was also a lot made about Charles and all the other royal family. But concentrating on the Queen since she just passed. So from 2002 to 2020, right? 4% of the predictions were too vague, 12% expected, 85% were wrong. Way worse than their normal number. So there were 12 predictions of the 26 were about her abdicating or dying. They were obsessed with that, especially because she was getting on in years. Even 20 years ago, she was getting on in years. They predicted she would abdicate or die in 2004, 2010, three people did, 2012, 2013, 14, 18, 19, 2020, twice. And she got older and older. And then, this last one, I see the queen leaving the spotlight by May, June, 2022. They got the right year, but they thought she would retire and live to 2023 20, or 25, so long. Not a single prediction about the Queen. <laughs> about anything. And, and this is a peek into the Queen Elizabeth predictions in the database. Donald Trump, yes, of interest even in Australia. So, more predictions about 1945 than about the Queen. 53 were made from 2004, well, before he became president, uh, to 2020. 11% were correct. But four of those were 50-50 odds, right? So only one was a, a good, good shot at it. 6% were too vague, 13% were expected, and 72% were damn wrong. So this was uh, from 2004. Uh, this is just when he was you know, known for his financial dealings, and it was talking about an earthquake basically happening under one of his buildings. No. Uh, Hillary's gonna win the election, not Trump, in 2016, if only. Uh, then Donald Trump will not remain in power long to be trumped by either Hillary Clinton or Michelle Obama. And no, two said no, didn't happen. Uh, and of course, this is an astrological one with Gemini. Donald Trump, according to his horoscope, will make a good president. He's trying to start exceptionally well on a positive note. And he's going to resign out of the blue in 2019 and 2020. People did not know Donald Trump. He wouldn't leave when he was supposed to leave. And as a peek into the database, how we do. Caps the Trump. <laughs> now, if anyone had predicted that he would try to stay in the White House, you know, that would have been an impressive correct prediction. No. All right, another category as what's going on in Europe. I think they would have gotten that one. War, 19 predictions about war made from 20, uh, 2001 to 2020. 
10% were correct, both arguably vague or expected. 10% uh, vague, 37% absolutely expected things like troops in Afghanistan will die, it's happening all the time. Uh, and 42% were wrong. A lower percent than their normal prediction rate, by the way. Some examples, you can see a lot more in the Middle East. 21, no. China and US will come to blows in 2012. Did not happen, not yet. Chemical and biological attacks starting to happen around the world in 2017. We missed that. North Korea invaded. I don't know who's going to do that. And eventually be more peace there. 2018. And a nuclear explosion in North Korea in 2018. No. Again, I want to point out that these aren't for an indefinite time in the future if they don't say that. They're this next year, this is what's going to happen. So uh, unrest in Saudi Arabia caught in the middle of the war in 2020. Uh, yeah. And a peek in the database for the war predictions. And I have two more of these categories. Natural disasters. This is my favorite category. Whenever I was on the team and we were scoring them, yes, a natural disaster. Because it's easier to, to look up if it happened or not, as opposed to, you know, Nicole Kibben's feeling down about something. <laughs> so they made 232 of these over, over the time we looked at. Only 5% were correct, 8% vague, 33 expected. Natural disasters, and this is like the bush and wildfires in Australia. Yeah, okay. Uh, wrong, right on their target, 53%. Some interesting examples I pulled out. Oh, we're going to get a severe cyclone, but someone has diverted it, so we won't suffer a bad direct hit. So this is an interesting thing that most of these people who do this don't understand physics <laughs> at all. They make these like the one with the anti-gravity is going to be discovered. So yeah, this is part of her. Just, she published this in a magazine that someone diverted the hurricane, and in fact it was wrong because a cyclone hit that year. So I guess the person who was going to divert it had a headache and couldn't do it. <laughs> Bad earthquakes in Israel. You know, um, Ms. Rose predicted major catastrophes in. Three countries, and those do happen, but not that year. Volcanic eruption in the Indian subcontinent, no. Oh, watch the media for discussions of Planet X. When they're <laughs> approaching our solar system, having a major impact on our sun's solar flares. Again, not understanding anything about physics. <laughs> and that can mean more severe weather or earthquake disasters. Again, no, it doesn't work that way. Flares don't cause earthquake disasters, and no, they didn't happen. Pacific Islands going completely underwater it may eventually happen, but it didn't in 2012. Again, Sydney being hit by an earthquake. Uh, next few years in this case, no. Hawaii, another large volcanic eruption. It, this, this could have probably put into the vague one, because large is ambiguous, and there's also always little volcanic eruptions there, but there was nothing large. Uh, large solar flares impacting the US, interfering in electric supply. That actually could happen, but did not. Tsunami warning, Australia, no. Seven Hills of Rome would be flattened. <laughs> <laughs> and there, there is a Los Angeles big hit, a huge earthquake. I mean, that would have, wow, I got that right if it happened, but it did not. And again, not physics. Eclipse is coming up, triggering natural disasters. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Whoa. Yeah. And our database with those predictions. And this is the last one, and I put this in here just for this group, religion. <laughs> right? They didn't talk about this too much because Australia is not a very you know, religious country. But 13 predictions about religion were made in the database. 8% correct, a lot too vague, and right on the target, of, you know, a little bit of mid 50s long. Could be a new Pope in the Vatican over the next two years. No, that happened pretty close there. No, not the next two years. Sorry, Kerry. Sarah Jessica Parker, connection with Tom Cruise, working with him or taking an interest in his religion, Scientology. Not anywhere publicized, so no. Adelaide, a uh, city in Australia, city of churches, we call the city of miracles because there's going to be miracles there, nothing published about that. Uh, Sarah, Duchess of York, may turn to religion or become a hermit. Dalai Lama. Health scare, nothing in the papers, so we just said no to that. Another papal assassination attempt, uh, 15 did not happen. 
Another Tom Cruise one starting to speak more on behalf of Scientology after Leah Remini came out and slammed Scientology. Actually, it didn't happen, surprisingly. And our religion looked in the database. So, maybe as interesting as what they predicted incorrectly was what they did not see coming, right? That's the crazy They didn't see this coming. So, after we went through the entire database, uh, as we did to come up with the numbers. What we then did is we, well, let's look at each of the years and see what big historic things happened that nobody mentioned. And they should have. If they can predict what Nicole Kim wants for breakfast tomorrow, you know, <laughs> if an asteroid slams into Australia, you think they would see that coming. Well, that didn't happen. But. All right, so, and by the way, the people who predict these things always have websites and they, they, they print about how accurate they are and all the historic predictions they made are correct. They never mention these things, right? They never mention the things they didn't see coming. So we went through and we found all this data, so I'm going to show you something of it. I think we picked out 10 for each year, which was you know, way more than that. You can, by the way, easy to do in Wikipedia. Right? They list, there's a, there's a year in Wikipedia and it's major events, and you can find this stuff easy. So, starting with the first year we were looking at the predictions for, 2000. The first time the Supreme Court decided the winner of the presidential election. And even though these are Australians, they did always make predictions about the US, right? Yeah, as you saw with the Trump, the Hillary stuff. Uh, locally, Australia, the worst drought in the whole century. And they're always talking about rains and floods, and they didn't get that one. Colombia, destruction uh, of farm reentry. First such thing ever happened in the space program. Uh, you know, and no, nobody mentioned it. This is a huge one, right? Quarter of a million people killed in a few hours by a tsunami earthquake. Nobody saw that coming. Coordinated suicide bombings hitting London. They're always these Australian psychics are always talking about um, the UK. Didn't get mentioned. Steve Irwin, uh, if you remember him, um, television personality, a freak uh, of death, not not seen coming. And hell, the iPhone, right? It, it, it revolutionized technology. And they, they do have a lot of technology predictions. That one was not seen. Uh, National heat wave, not mentioned. Michael Jackson's very uh, young death, also not mentioned. A, a large earthquake hitting Chile and a tsunami, not mentioned. And, I'm sure everyone knows this one, the big one that uh, Fukushima, our latest uh, history nuclear disaster, triggered by a tsunami. Should have seen it coming, and they did it. Few more. The Sandy Hook school shootings, they were all there are. They do talk about people being killed. Sometimes they mention, oh, there will be one person who's shot in a, in, a, in, a, in a mall or something. They didn't see that one. Uh, the deadliest structural failure in history. Uh, amazing number of people killed and injured in Bangladesh. Not seen. The famous Malaysian Airlines uh, disappearance, which was in the news for months and months and months, never mentioned. Uh, again, about local in Australia, once in a lifetime, storm hit Sydney, no, liquid. now we get to some science. They do occasionally try to predict science things, like anti-gravity being found, right? Well, <laughs> no, NASA announces liquid water on Mars. That was a, a stupendous scientific uh, find, not mentioned. Gravitational waves. Um, go back to politics here, Obama visits Cuba, first president to do it since 28, not mentioned. And I think I've got one more page of these if you're getting bored with them. There are so <laughs> many. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce that. The first known interstellar object detected passing through the solar system, given a Hawaiian name. Uh, France, horrible civil unrest, fire engulfing Notre Dame in Paris, and the pandemic. There was always retroactive claims that these people predicted this, but they always made some kind of vague statement in all years about something like this happening. And because of the pandemic, the Dow Jones huge drop. And then I mentioned nothing right about the king at all, the queen, sorry. So the queen or the, the, the King Charles, uh, which there were a lot of predictions about King Charles when he would become king, and nobody got it right that it would be in 2022. And that wasn't in our database. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's real or if it's a great thing. <laughs> So why do believers think psychics are accurate, right? So the media promotes these people with the claims that they're the real deal, 
and they rarely ever fact check the predictions they make on their shows or whatever later, right? Oh, Tommy's not gonna play. Oh, he doesn't play on this machine. All right, well that was a little video, because this is not a pure Windows machine that didn't want to play. But basically it's five or six American daytime TV shows introducing psychics that are going to be on that episode. All of which, including Dr. Oz, you know, saying these people are all psychic. Not that they all claim to be psychic. These people are all psychic. And then all the cable stations have their own psychics that they promote. Uh, and by the way, they're all mediums, because that's even more interesting than just being predict the future by talking to dead people and helping predict the future and whatever else you want to say. So yeah, there's Teresa Caputo, there, there's Tyler Henry, and, and again, none of these say this is done for entertainment purposes. They, they're claimed all on television to be real. Uh, Thomas John is the, the latest flavor. He had two shows, Seatbelt Psychic and the Thomas John Experience. Um, yeah, he picks up my chair passengers or gets them communicating with the dead. <laughs> and then, no matter where you go, you see things like this, you know, on the storefronts and magazine uh, shops. It, it's just, it's like, it's, it's just as real as anything else. And I took this photo on the way home one day. It's wow. really pissed me off, because clearly the school was trying to raise money. Let's throw a psychic fair and teach all the students here that this is real shit. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, I came across this because one of my co-workers at Recovering from Religion used to be the business manager for the Spirit University in Sarasota, Florida. And, and uh, they not only, you can go there and you can you know, have your palms read and see the psychic, but they'll teach you how to do it because everyone has these abilities. And this is their list of facilitators. The uh, third person down is a famous person, Evan Alexander. He wrote Heaven is Real. He was a neuroscientist who had his own near-death experience and then now he promotes it as if it's real. Two after that is Raymond Moody. He's the person who invented the term near-death experience, MDE. So this is a big deal with this university. And uh, yeah, they're out there teaching people this stuff is real and collecting money about it. So besides all that with the media, the other reason people believe it is the psychics ignore their own predictions. And uh, you know, they just go to great lengths to make their track records whenever they come and talk about it or on their web websites, like they're accurate, right? They make, as I showed you, predictions for expected events, they count those as correct, and it obfuscates the situation. Uh, they take credit for vague predictions, and then they say, yeah, look, I got that right. It's like, well, it's not exactly what you said, but I got it right, right? And then they, uh, they ignore the unmade predictions, the, the things they should have seen coming, and this is probably the most egregious one. They count wrong predictions as correct on their own websites and social media. And I'm going to give you an example of that. Kerry Culkins is in our database a lot. You might have noticed her name. This is her own website. So every year she publishes her own predictions that were in the papers or wherever else she made them. And she puts the list and then she puts that little mark there. You can see there. This, I got this right. So here's her look at um, 2001. 2001. The, uh, the, white, the white ones are ours that we uh, vehemently disagreed with. <laughs> so uh, I'll skip down to the bottom, uh, the one, two above the bottom, and we soon be able to get free energy from empty space by harnessing the magnetic field. <laughs> she says she got that correct. I haven't seen any physics papers, I'm sorry. I don't know what kind of secret stuff she's looking at. And again, using anti-gravity to lift. Yes, she marked herself correct. <laughs> All right, why does this matter? So uh, Pew did a survey of belief in New Age beliefs. Uh, 2018, I don't know if there's a more current one, this is the one I found, and they broke it up by forms of Christianity for some reason. I didn't mention other religions. But, so on average, 41% believe in psychics. So almost, you walk down the street, half the people ask, they believe this, right? And it's interesting to me that it, it's slightly different in different forms of Christianity. Uh, Catholics are the highest for some reason. Uh, evangelicals, probably because they're told it's the devil, are, are the least, 33%. Uh, uh, but the scary thing to me is nothing in particular, which might mean people here, are higher than that. They're 52%. So 
So it's like people who've come out of religion and they don't buy the dogma, the Bible's wrong, the Quran's wrong, and the Bhagavad Gita's wrong, but it's gotta be something, man, this seems real. So that is, to me, disturbing. So, how do they take advantage of this, the psychics? Well, uh, $2 billion, and this is by data, data I'm gonna show you on this page is from the American Federation of Certified Psychics and Mediums. They're certified, so you know the sure. <laughs> And this is already data that's over five, six, seven years old, but $2 billion. And the pandemic drove this up, I gotta tell you, because they had to rent the place before to do readings, and now everyone is comfortable with Zoom. And I've been involved with things on psychics who charge $400 to sit there for an hour. And, and they'll give you, because there's a bunch of people, 10 minutes maybe. And they don't have to pay Zoom anything, except what is it, $15 a year or a month. But it's like, this number must be astronomical now because of the pandemic. <clears throat> yeah, and so this is old data. The average psychic was making, and please don't take this as career advice, but that's what <laughs> <laughs> Reasonably successful by the standards of the American Federation of Certified Psychics Media. Half a million. And the mega names that you see, five million plus. Mm -hmm. So this is all coming from people who believe this. Right? Now, this is sort of a different category. This is this agency is admitting that in this one year period, 2011 12, 200 million was scammed. And they mean by people who are fake psychics who take people's <laughs> money. So, but that's what they mean, uh, yeah. And this is interesting to me. There's a, a, a great gender disparity here, right? Uh, if you look at the second column number of women, third column number of men, the more you're willing to spend on this in a year, it goes down from 1000 to $10,000, the ratio of the gender disparity changes from an already high six to one to almost a thousand to one. It's like, I don't understand. And this isn't to say that men aren't, you know, believing in paranormal and gullible things. Because if you go to a UFO conference or a Bigfoot conference, it's probably almost all men. So, but there's this difference in who believes in psychics and who believes in all these other things. Summary of the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you attended my previous talk here on the subject, which was right before the pandemic, um, I think I was actually the month it was starting. I might have been the, the last speaker you guys had there. Did you um, predict it? I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I spoke with Kenny Biddle. Kenny Biddle is the paranormal investigator. Which, by the way, if people remember Kenny Biddle, he has just been made the, the uh, chief investigator for CFI now, which is like a full-time paying job, and he moved from Pennsylvania up to Buffalo this weekend. Uh, so he, he's on their staff now, quite incredible. Anyway, I wrote this article, which was the basis of my, my presentation here, about what's the harm in believing in this. And it's not even just going and pay $100, and even maybe $1,000 a year to the, it's the people who get ripped off of their life savings because they get hooked by a con artist who will do that to them. And my whole other talk was, about the egregious nature of that and the fact that the legal system is not on your side if that happens to you. It's very rare that you can get your money back and it happens all the time. Anyway, so you can Google that if you're interested in finding it. Already I take my card and the, I have my, my site on there which you can find all my articles and that's on it. So after we finished this whole project, we thought it was important enough to, to start talking about it in places and publicizing it, even while we were doing it. So we were not quite finished with it, and this was the first um, thing that was published about it in March. So we still had almost a year to go. Adrian Hill published a progress report on this in The Skeptic, which is the magazine uh, for skepticism in Australia. And then in uh, late 2021, Richard Saunders, who ran the project, gave a progress report for the Bay Area skeptics over Zoom and the Australian skeptics locally at their national conference. And then the final report was published by Richard Saunders in The Skeptic in late 2021. Um, he also followed up with another <laughs> article with those interesting things that I told you, that the things they didn't see coming. And then I wrote two articles about it, one for the online version of The Skeptical Inquirer and one was actually in their print magazine. And that's a, Interesting, that was the cover shot. Uh, I forgot what was in here. 
of our a typical Zoom session with Richard Saunders at the in the top center, and, and the rest of us uh, supporting it. And then I was really happy about this when articles translated to Spanish. So in the Spanish-speaking world, this was in Argentine magazine uh, named Pensar. So uh, following the report coming out, Richard Saunders, as well as Tim Mendham, who's, who's the executive officer of, of that organization, they were interviewed numerous times in Australian media, print and radio, regarding the results. And then I took it upon myself to, to reach out to um, Seth Andrews. People know who that is? Anyone know the thinking Andrews? Okay, so people might appreciate this audio if it plays. Okay, today we're going to talk about the ratios and predictive success of psychics. Two very special guests today. I'll let them talk more about what they do, but just uh, some quick background. Rob Palmer has a background in engineering, and he's done some impressive sounding work. Spacecraft designer, aerospace project engineer, computer programmer. And he was once a believer in extraordinary claims before he began to pursue a more critical path. You can find his Facebook page for the well-known skeptic that's easily searchable. He writes for Skeptical Inquirer and more. And then Richard Saunders is an Australian skeptic, podcaster, and debunker. He has served as past president for the Australian Skeptics. He hosts the Skeptic Zone podcast. Both of these guys were involved in a project called the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project. What happens when you actually track psychic predictions to determine accuracy, reliability, etc.? What happens when you take a scientific lens to these supernatural claims? How refreshing. So today we're talking about this very thing. And a huge welcome to Rob Palmer and Richard Saunders. Thanks for coming to talk about the project. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, so that was amazing to be able to, uh, <laughs> to, to spread that on it. It's kind of, we, we talk in the skeptic verse about, you know, preaching outside the choir, because I'm going to be giving this presentation at PSYCON, which is a conference of skeptics. Most of them are going to really understand that, you know, these people are full of it. Um, but it's great to go out to an audience like that, because most people who listen to, to Seth don't normally hear about this kind of a subject. So, some closing thoughts. Um, I would say the, the appalling record uncovered by our analysis right, of this huge set of data combined with the failure to predict the amazing number of historic items in the period we studied should just be embarrassing you know, to people claiming to have these powers. And it's almost like none of them are psychic. <laughs> uh, so, the, there's a saying that you know, uh, evidence of absence isn't absence of isn't really absence of the phenomenon. But in fact, absence of evidence is evidence of absence. Right? It doesn't prove it's not true, but it goes a long way to say, well, there should be something here if this is real. Right? So I would say, as a proper scientific skeptic, maybe somebody is actually psychic out there, and they weren't in our database, and we don't have the data for them. Right? I have to leave that open, because it's hard to prove a negative. But. No one has ever proved they can do this, right? Psychic, mediumship, paranormal, dowsing, any kind of claims like this have been investigated and never been found to be authentic by people who aren't in that field already trying to prove it because they believe it already, right? There was for decades a $1 million paranormal challenge, uh, and it was never successfully won. Uh, there's 25 other prizes to be won currently totaling that same amount of money in the world. Uh, the, the organization that prints the uh, magazine that I write for, the Center for Inquiry, uh, has an independent investigation group. They currently have the largest prize, a quarter of a million dollars. Anyone who can prove they can do this stuff. And there's even a referral fee from the friends who refer. <laughs> My friend Mary's a psychic, and she knows you get $5,000. So you can actually see these other prizes on Wikipedia's page, list of prizes for evidence of the paranormal, and as I said, they're totaling a million dollars. What was discovered? Richard Saunders. In many, many hours of pouring through these predictions. If you want to be a successful scientist in the prediction game, make 
many predictions. Make as many as you possibly can churn out and keep most of them vague and ethereal. And then sprinkle those with some very precise predictions. And when occasionally your very precise predictions come true, which they must if you make a lot of them, <laughs> if you make a lot of predictions in general, then that's the ones you, you point out. And you say, I predicted this would happen. And all the other ones are forgotten, especially by the media, because the story is this type of going right. That's all they're interested in. So that's it. I wanted to give Richard the last word since he organized and ran the project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's have some Q&A here, and we're going to try something. This is a small enough group. If you can make your voice to Rob, and he can answer it, and he can moderate, that's fine. If not, we have some wireless mics here. I'm going to ask the first question, if I might. Yeah, sure. What fraction of these people know that they're charlatans? Well, that's a very good question. <laughs> I, I have asked that to people who I know personally who did this stuff sort of, well, let me tell you about a specific person. Mark Edward. He's notable enough, he's got his own Wikipedia page. He's an author, he wrote a book called um, Psychic Blues, Confessions of a Conflicted Medium, right? So uh, he worked for the Psychic Friends Network, the thing where you call up for 99 cents a minute, right? And he was one of their top performers, they tried to make a TV show with him. So he got into this to see what was going on here, like, because he knew he wasn't psychic, is anyone else psychic? Uh, and he learned the ropes, and I have talked to him repeatedly about this, and he believes they all know they're not. Now, I talk to other people who don't agree with that, so it's, it's not a, just an agreed upon thing. Um, but but he, the, the thing is, even he tells the story, when he was answering these phone calls, and he would get repeat calls from the same people, you helped me so much last month when you predicted that, because that's what happened. He was like, oh, wow, okay, thank you. <laughs> And he said, if you're the right type of personality, the feedback there can make you believe you have these powers. And I, I do think this happens to some people. Um, but it, it's hard to know from a percent basis. Now, I talked about people who rip people off of their life savings. Clearly, they're con artists. Uh, I also mentioned Thomas John, who's a seatbelt psychic. Um, he's the one on two different television shows. He's the medium who picks up rideshare passengers and talks to the dead. There's also the Thomas John Experiences of two shows. He's an absolute fraud. We did a stain on him. We sent people into the audience with faked Facebook accounts. Uh, and he happened to call on Susan, and the same person I mentioned for Mark, by the way, Mark Edwards was there. We, as a team, had set up fake Facebook accounts for them under false names with all false family histories. And he, from the stage, read all the stuff to them, like he's speaking to their dead relatives, which was from the Facebook page. <laughs> you know, it was like Susan's dead brother, Andy, who died of pancreatic cancer. She didn't even have a brother. And Susan's taking out the tissues and wiping her eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and they got this in recording. The New York Times published this. So clearly he knows he's a fraud. Right? Uh, the, the, the thing is, though, it doesn't matter. It's all about money. Less than one year later, he became the house act at Caesar's Palace. They opened up a show, the Thomas John show, you know, 50 bucks a seat, 100 bucks a seat, whatever, come and have an amazing reading where you're going to talk to your dead relatives. This was after the New York Times outed him. And it, and it was New York Times Magazine, which is like 40 million views. Didn't matter to them. It's a shame. Other questions? Tim. Well, has anyone uh, done a detailed study of the backgrounds of the psychic of the psychics? Like, what's their education level? Have they have do they have any criminal records? That kind of thing? <laughs> well, I'm most familiar. I don't know about the people who do these things and write up in magazines specifically, but the ones who take it the extra step and also say they use psychic abilities to communicate with dead people. Very involved in people who bust with those people, like the one I just mentioned, Thomas John. And Thomas John has a criminal background. He actually, is, he's got a Wikipedia article. He was uh, arrested for selling apartments on Craigslist, which didn't exist. Uh, so yeah, he's a felon. Uh, one could say this is just par for the course. 
He says he's turned his life around, now he's spiritual and he talks to dead people. Um, <laughs> generally, the people, I know the, the private detective I talked about in my last talk, Bob Nygaard, who tries to get victims of these people their money back uh, by you know, bringing them to court. So he deals with the people who are, are, are at the extreme criminal end of this, which will take people for their life savings by claiming to have psychic abilities. Uh, and all of them you know, have criminal records. They, they get arrested, they get released, they move from place to place and change their names. Uh, and in fact, the way Bob Niger tells it, it's a criminal endeavor like the mafia uh, amongst, East, I'll say, Eastern European families as opposed to Italians and other mafia, maybe, <laughs> which is the Romani people in Canada. Not all Romani people, but if you find one of these people doing this, they're likely to be from that nationality because it's a, apparently it's a thing. Mm -hmm. People in, in, in that culture who've come to America, some percent of them, have gone into the to, you know organized crime essentially, and instead of you know the kind of thing that the Italian mob is known for, they do. Uh, these kinds of things. The women don't even go to school. They train their daughters to learn to do psychic scams. The boys are taught to do roofing uh, scams and driveway scams, and they take deposits and disappear and change their name. So those people have criminal records and, and sometimes avoid, avoid the law, for sure. I, the people who, who do it you know, for a living by publishing in magazines and websites, I don't know about, probably, probably not so much. Do you think it's possible that your organization is going to uh, do some investigating on all these so-called spiritual healing, uh, I don't even know what, what to call them, uh, the Reiki, all of them, you know, well, 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 you know, yeah, that's, it's saying, energy healing, that's energy yeah, healing. Right. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're deeply involved with that, the CF, CFI, CSI. Uh, writes articles and we have different writers who, who pay attention to that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, and, and, it, and it's not helped. Did anybody see the Goop Lab on, on Netflix? Or a part of the Goop Lab? So that was out last year, I think it was. Uh, so Goop is one of Poffer's company where she calls it a lifestyle brand, but they sell bullshit for a lot of money. Uh, it, like, you know, water bottles with, you know, a crystal in the bottom of them that will improve your life for $100 or whatever. But, um, so, th so, they, so she, Netflix gave her a deal and they made six episodes called The Goop Lab of six weeks of nonsense and one of them was all on energy healing and they actually had a chiropractor. It was embarrassing to watch. It was mm -hmm. when was chiropractor. So he got a whole half hour uh, of, you know, personal advertisement where he was claiming to, literally, he was a puppet master. He was picking people off the table and they were jerking as he's doing this above their bodies. He's claiming he's interacting with their energy fields. And yeah, so we, I, I've written about that. Other, other our people in the organization do write about this. But it, it's like, as James Randi used to say, these are unsinkable rubber ducks because people <laughs> want to believe this. And the media just helps it by making it like it's real. It's, it's a very unfortunate deal. I just want to interject that one of the big scandals at the Goop Lab is one of the products that they sold as bullshit was found out to be from ordinary cows. <laughs> <laughs> ordinary cows. Well, yes, that, that would have been sort of honest. By the gender disparity. In the, in the, I'm really interested about the gender disparity in the client base. And I'm, the I'm kind of thinking about different scientific or sociological or anthropological reasons why that exists. And is anybody really um, analyzing that and you know how that relates to this business? Well, I, I don't know if anyone is, but I, I haven't I haven't seen that. Um, is it uh, in Australia? Or that no, that was the Pew Research poll of Americans actually. And, and that's probably the same all over the world, because everyone I know who has gone and researched these things by going to a public reading where there's hundreds of people in the audience, the few men that are there look very uncomfortable, like they've been dragged there by their wives or girlfriends, you know, and it, it's all all women who ask the questions. And I, you know, I've heard I'm not a psychologist, but I've heard it's like women are more into emotions generally, and the psychics know this and they prey on that part of it. Um, 
That's you know, the only thing I've heard about it, but I don't know that there's been any scientific look at, at that. Nor why are, people, why are men the ones who are obsessed with finding Bigfoot in the woods? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> don't know. Uh, Chris has a question. Um, there's a number of people in the financial industry, some of them prominent figures, who are constantly wrong about their predictions with very low accuracy. And they are still well being paid for years. <laughs> the whole mechanism goes like that if they wrong, media don't touch the subject for like two years. When they write, media raises up and they talk. But like for 10 years, the media are like rules. Would you say this is the same mechanism? Well, I, I think the media likes, likes to promote the fact that people can do miraculous things, even if it's not quite a miracle there. Yeah, it, it, it's like, it's, it's never new, there's not a lot more. You know, they, they just want to make things look good, and, and they, they do it for pretty much any subject, unfortunately. Um, it is possible to predict the future based on analysis if you look at trends and things like that. Right, right. All right, you know, it is. Right, statistically. Yeah, yeah statistically. Yeah. Um, you know, did you make any distinctions for that when you were looking at some of these psychics who said, hey, you know, you could just figure this out? Well, those sorts of things, if, if the plot appropriate, they went into the expected categories. Okay. And, right, yeah, the birth rate will rise this year in Australia. And then we would look at if we could find a chart for that. Just pulling that off the top of my head, if we have one that, I think. There was a list that had birth rates on Australia. And every year, before the woman made that prediction, they were going up. So that, that was expected. Right. 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 Now, if it, they had been going down, and then she said that, we would have given that as correct, because that would have been an unusual thing. Right. Yeah, that, that definitely is something. Oddly, a lot of these people seem not to care about researching it. You'd think that would be something they could do to drive their percent correct up, right? <laughs> Sit down at a computer, research a trend, purposely, like that one, and then they just say it. But mostly it just seems they just do it off the top of their head. So they notice the birth rate's going up, so she said that in this example. But a lot of times they don't seem to even do that when they could do that, uh, because they know it doesn't matter. Right? They're going to publish 100 predictions, and they're going to check them all correct, and the media is just going to just publish them without looking at what the results were. So they don't even have to put the extra energy into making sure they're right, or try to be closer to right. Mm -hmm. they, you know, the people who are predicting things that break the laws of physics, do you think they opened the crack the physics book or even looked at an article on Wikipedia? No. Uh, Bill, they don't care. No, related to your question is a uh, book I can recommend called Super Forecasters, hmm. where they did a study where they took um, um, people who were talented researchers and investigators, and they asked them to make predictions in the future that would, would not have fallen in this vague category, mm -hmm. it would be specific. And they found some number of people were actually very talented at it. And actually what? They were actually talent, talented, talented okay. at making future predictions. Mm -hmm. And they talked about some of the things that they did differently. So it's a good book, it's called um, super forecasters. Other questions? Did, did uh, NBC and ABC and CBS interview you? Uh, like the mainstream media, the National New York Times Magazine. What did your findings with any of the mainstream media? Did no, so, so that the New York Times article was about the specific sting we did against the psychic media. Uh, and it was. Uh, it was very hard to get them to do that. And no, we didn't have anybody else call off, unfortunately. No, none of the big ones. We did have, after that came out in the New York Times, um, like smaller journals and whatever, like copied the story. But no one was interested enough to contact us for any special information, unfortunately. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I would say they mostly don't want to print stuff like that. They don't care. Yeah, so, so a little bit more background on what was in the New York Times. So what happened was Susan Gerbic, who I mentioned before, uh, who, who was very apt to write articles and try to protect people from psychic harm artists, she's the one who runs these things, and she had run other successful ones and contacted a lot of places to try to get them to air it, and nobody would touch it. The New York Times did contact her back and said, well, this is interesting, but we would have to see what you're doing live in order to cover this, because." You know, we don't trust you, we just want, we want to see this. 
So she said, okay, I'll set up another one and I'll bring you along. So this is what happened. Uh, we set up one on Matt Fraser, if anyone's, anyone's heard of his show, Meet the Frasers. Uh, he was talking in Pennsylvania and we sent people into the audience to get a reading from him. And one of the people who was there was Jack Hitt, who was a New York Times reporter. Fairly famous guy, actually, in journalist circles. So he, he came along hoping to see what had happened. But it turns out that uh, Fraser did not call on any of our people. So we couldn't catch him there. But uh, since Jack was there through the process, he saw us set up the fake Facebook profiles. He saw what we did. He saw how we wrote it up later. The, the Times dragged us through a little bit, but they finally said, well, I think that's enough. We will publish what you tell, tell us happened last year with that other psychic comedian, Thomas Jung. So that's how we got the article published. So they talked about both of these things, and one that wasn't successful, that Jack Hitt went along with in the article, but they also talked about what we said happened, because we had video proof, by the way, of, of the one that happened against Thomas Jung. Uh, and that was covered, like I said, once it was in the New York Times Magazine, other places ran copies of it and things like that, but there wasn't really any follow-up. And as I said, Caesar's Palace decided to give him his own show later that year. Oh, and they got another television show. By the way, Seatbelt Psychic was on before that, and the Thomas John experience was on after he got caught by the Red Times. <laughs> uh, well, I'm yeah. sorry to say that Red Bank now has two, I'll call them mystic crystal shops, with a very large number of square feet, especially in so-called Earth Sphere, yeah. which is right on Broad Street. It's right in the middle of all the restaurants. It's big too. And I'm curious, having seen that, is anyone uh, studying, like, let's say, the number of crystal shops growing in America? Or, you know, from a um, quantitative perspective, how could we um, dis discover what's happening in terms of these kinds of beliefs? No, that's interesting. I, I, I don't know specifically what anyone looking into that. But, like, from, I, I sat down one day to see how many psychics are there in America? And you know, how big is the business? Well, I presented the, the, the thing about the $2 billion. Um, so it was about that time, it was a couple of years ago I looked into that. And I was able to find, using Google, actually, how many psychic businesses are there in America? So I, I bet you could do that in Google. Uh, it, and that was a frightening number, by the way. Um, it, it, it was hundreds of thousands of psychics. Chris. I understand that there is human desire for international relational beliefs. Okay. Yeah, there is, okay. So now the question is, is it possible to organize is to and manipulate this desire into massive political force? So already been done. Constantly. The insurrection. Yeah. <laughs> it's already been done. There's a quote um, from a great philosopher that says, if you can get them to believe in absurdities, you can get them to cause atrocities. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah who said that? I have seen that as a little bit. Who's that? Okay. QAnon. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, one of my co-writers is Skeptical from Fire, Stephanie Kremmer, sounds like it's not open up, Kremmer. And, and she was, it's fascinating, you could look up uh, her name, Stephanie K, K. Kremmer, uh, Skeptical from Fire, you probably get her article. She was a Sandy Hook uh, denier. She thought that that was a false flag operation. She was deep into conspiracy. She was getting pulled into QAnon. And then something happened, I, I forget what she said. Oh, yeah. Our, a, a friend of ours, a long-term friend, said, oh my god, my sister lived at Sandy Hook, her, her, you know, she knows her, her friend's kid was killed. And then that, oh my god, this is right and wrong. And, and she totally pulled her out of it, she started investigating it. Now she investigates and writes about QAnon and you know, all these worse conspiracies uh, from the perspective of somebody who used to believe this stuff. It, it's quite fascinating. I have a question. Uh, the two, the two point one uh, billion dollars uh, is that part of the GNP? <laughs> <laughs> yes, because that was the official report from the American Association of Psychics and Mediums. Right. So this is what their own people in that organization reported to them. 
So I presume those were credit card charges that they okay. had to fess up to. I would imagine it was under the table payments of cash that weren't in that number. So that absolutely has to be a low ball, even for the official records. And by the way, that's just that one Federation of American Psychics of Meetings. I don't know, you know, how, can you not be a psychic if you're not a, you know, it's like you can't be a doctor if you're not named? I don't think so. <laughs> so that's a way low ball. If I understood the introduction correctly, you yourself had a bit of a transformation. Yeah. Did I get that right? Could you speak about well, that? Well, yeah. Well, it, it, most, most people I meet in the skeptical movement did. And, and it's probably because when you're a kid and a teenager, it's hard to differentiate reality from fact, especially when you're brought up by religion, like I was. You know, there's supernatural stuff out there, right? So it's just the next level, especially when you start to read someone's mind. Um, but also, yes, I believe. Aliens were abducting people, that was a big one of mine. Um, uh, I probably believed in psychics, although I didn't have too much experience as a kid. I know I believed in cryptids like the Loch Ness Monster, um, things like that. And it, it is a weird story because I was turned around by finding the magazine I now write for as a teenager, Skeptical <laughs> Inquirer in the library. And I said, wow, oh, this is cool. I had a picture of some interesting thing on the cover that's like aliens. Oh, look at this one. Oh, oh, that's not real. <laughs> oh, that's not real. Oh, this I knew was bullshit. Oh, but wait, that I believe, that's not. And, and then, you know, uh, decades and decades and decades later, I got actually asked to write for them, so it was kind of amazing. But most people I know, including Richard Saunders, talks about this publicly too. Yeah, he was all in. You know, especially at the age we're in, there were three channels on TV, and you turn on television, and, you know, Leonard Nimoy is talking about you know, psychics and, and stuff like that, like it's a real thing. And you couldn't turn on the internet even to Google anything to check it. I mean, maybe you could find a book at the library, but I remember going to the library and finding books on alien species who had visited Earth with pictures, and each, this species has this kind of alien spaceship, and this species has this kind of alien spaceship, and I thought that was for real. Oh, the thing that changed my mind about that was I got that book, after we had obtained photos of the far side of the moon. But it was written before there was any vehicles in space at all. And it had drawings of the far side of the moon with giant cities on it. <laughs> so when I got to the end of the book, and I, oh my god, this is all bullshit. <laughs> Do you think that uh, I'm not sure Yeah. It seems like you can't, nobody knows what's real. Right? I, I understand. And, and one of the bigger uh, QAnon, that's a big one, right? That wouldn't have been a thing, uh, at least to the extent where it almost caused uh, a, 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 you know, an actual change to our government. Um, but one of the more widely, uh, you know, you can research it is the belief in the flat earth, right? So before. YouTube outside. Before YouTube, it was really a minor thing. There, there was the Flat Earth Society, which was literally pamphlets being printed in somebody's house sent out to a mailing list of a thousand people, right? And, and now there's tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands who believe it in this country. And they have national conferences where and they write books and people buy them because they believe it. And it is largely because of the internet and YouTube. In fact, um, what's his name? Michael Sargent, I think. Michael Sargent. Who, who, wrote, who, who did the videos called Flat Earth Clues, which are slickly done. Uh, I've seen a few of them. And if you don't know anything about science or whatever, and ask a lot of questions, you, you get pulled into that trap. Wow, oh, the Earth is really flat. The globe is, is a lie. Um, and Michael Sargent says that all the people he met as, as the movement was growing and growing and growing came to him because they saw either his or other videos on YouTube. And and the reason they saw them on YouTube is because of YouTube's algorithms, right? And Facebook does this too, and probably the other uh, social media. Like, they present to you something similar to what you're already watching. So if someone looks at a conspiracy like the Kennedy assassination, okay, that's not paranormal, it's not out of the realm of possibility that there was something else involved besides Oswald, although I don't think so. But if you're watching that, 
the next thing is, is you may like this, like Earth Clues, or things about Reiki, or things about whatever else, QAnon. Mm -hmm. And I know in recent years they've tried to cut back on that, but it might be too late. <laughs> On the, uh, on the modern flat earth people, there's a very good documentary I recommend. It's called Behind the Curve, where a uh, good journalist went in to meet some of these people. And they, these people, the believers are very sincere. Um, in fact, um, they, they wanted to prove the earth was, was flat and not spinning. So they paid $18,000 to buy a high-end gyroscope to prove the earth was flat. And they found out that the Earth, and the gyroscope said that the Earth was turning at 15 degrees per hour. Um, 15 times 24 is 316. So um, they were confused by the results, and they had to get a better Faraday cage for it. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then they put it in the Faraday cage, and it still did that. And then the guy was caught on the hot mic. He's like, we can't tell anybody about this result. <laughs> right. that's, a, that's in the documentary. Yeah. It's a shield. Where are you at UFOs? Where am I? Mm -hmm. They haven't gotten me yet, at least I don't know. <laughs> so, so yeah, all, all of the recent stuff that's been in the media, including uh, investigations before in the House, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm well aware of all of that. It's a whole other topic if you want to talk about it. But, but in, in general, I know skeptics who, who spend their time investigating that stuff. And, um, I mean, there's not, there's not enough there to proclaim what physicist Mishukaku said, which is now we have to make the assumption that if you can't prove it's not real, it is real. Yeah. He, has been, yeah. he has been bought yeah. by that in his yeah. head. I don't mean with money. I mean, he, he's bought into it. And it, he's become an embarrassment to scientists and skeptics, actually. Um, it's very unfortunate. But no, there's not enough evidence for this. It, it turns out there are reasonable explanations for all of the current stuff that the media, again, promotes like it's proof. And in fact, I've watched videos on CNN and ABC where they begin the, the, the book of showing the video that says, no explanation for this. And I can, my friend Mick West has videos on his channel that explains this exactly, like why this is like this, why it looks like that in the video. You know, this is because of the aperture and this kind of camera makes something Speak the triangular UFOs or the pyramid shaped UFOs. He actually showed it. He had a pyramid, he could do it himself. And in fact, then he shows the video. See, it's not just the three they're looking at that they're saying you're supposed to see the ones that are fixed, those are stars, they're all triangles too. It's because there's a camera aperture problem. And then he's a pilot, Mick West. So he goes in and he, you can find out the flight path of every plane that's ever flown. And he goes, ah, oh, yep, from this where this guy was taken, that was flight number 444 United. I mean, but meanwhile, ABC and CNN, look at that, that's unexplained. And then they'll bring people from the UFO community on, who this has been their life, to try to prove this is real. And they are now being funded by the US government and your taxes to promote this and try to prove it's real. And there's really no more there that's ever been there. It's like, there's not any reasonable evidence to propose that these things are real, despite what Mr. Kaka said. Uh, we're getting on towards noon. We'll take one or two more questions here. In the back. In the back. Yeah, I just want to make an obvious statement that I think we're wired to believe that absurdity, especially since most of us came from religion. And if you can believe in the virgin birth and the yeah. heart and all those, it's not just a little jump to go to something really fantastical. Yeah, and especially in this field of the psychics. And, and, and when you go to mediums. Actually, in my other presentation, I have something with Stephen Novella, who's a neuroscientist. He's the host of the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast. I really recommend that. It's a good intersection between science and skepticism. And he actually had a quote that I used that was something like that. Yes, if you can program through religion to believe in supernatural deities and people who could read your mind and hear your prayers, it's a tiny leap to believe someone else can talk to dead people and tell you what they say. That's about the same thing I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah and, and, and for the rest of it, that's not necessarily super. Like if aliens are real and visiting Earth, that's not supernatural. Right? It's just that people want to believe there's more to the world than there is. And you know, the media hypes that up. Uh, and that's just it. It's like, it's, it's Fox Mulder's poster. I want to believe, right? And if you want to believe, there, there's a bias called confirmation bias. 
motivated reasoning is another one. You're going to accept the facts that prove to you what you already believe and ignore all the stuff that says, no, this is nonsense. It works with psychics, it works with UFOs, it works with you know, politics, everything. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yes. Who would you want to say if you had to uh, make a, uh, a uh, guess? Which uh, media from around the planet is most from the financial? Uh, I don't know. Beyond my so paper. Oh, it's got my paper. Right? No, <laughs> would you make a national inquiry action? That's all right. Know, but national inquiry, isn't that one of the ones that publishes this stuff a lot? National inquiry? I don't know. <laughs> Inquire, the National yeah. Inquirer. Don't, you haven't read that. They're, they're the ones with like the, you know, my baby was yeah. from alien yeah. 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 and yeah. Are they still around? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, they got started. Um, they actually got started when um, newspapers, so, when newspapers started printing in color, um, they had to get rid of their black and white printers. So what are we going to do with black and white newspaper printers? And the answer was it started the National Inquirer. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually true. I remember that from, from when um, they had the picture of the let's see, NASA pictured Martians, and it was like the bald cat, <laughs> the, 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 the space cat <laughs> was on the cover. I was like, this is a Martian. <laughs> No, he doesn't, but a really good friend of Donald Trump does. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that pecker guy. Whoever his name is. Yeah. Um, so, so another thing by the, by the aliens, by the way, every president who's come into the that I know about has always said, I'll find out about the aliens and tell you. Like, you, know, right? <laughs> right. you know, mostly there was, okay, if it was real, well, they would understand, like, you know, no, I really have to keep the secret for whatever reason. Do you think Donald Trump would have kept the secret? <laughs> You have little dead bodies of aliens in Mar-a-Lago. I mean, it's like, <laughs> which is probably why the FBI raided it to get them back. <laughs> Thank you for joining today's forum. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you'd like to continue the discussion and get in something to eat, some of us are going to Johnny's Pizzeria. Johnny's Pizzeria is at 15 Whitehall Place for lunch. Let me know if you need directions. Have a wonderful day, and thank you very much.